Good afternoon, everyone, and good evening, wherever you might happen to be. And thank you for joining us um, for this uh, lunchtime here webinar on Russian civil society in the time of COVID-19. Uh, my name is Alex Cooley. I'm the current director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. And on behalf of myself and my co-chair, Josh Tucker, who is director of the Jordan Center at NYU, we'd like to welcome you to this latest uh, installment of the Russian Public Policy Series that we jointly run um, with generous support from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. So those who have been with us before over the summer uh, have known that we have switched our seminar series virtually. And the purpose of the seminar series is to um, bring expertise, both academic and professional expertise in dialogue about current important issues that are happening uh, in Russia uh, and also uh, to field uh, questions and encourage dialogue and debate. And of course, uh, COVID uh, has been at the center of everyone's world. Uh, a month ago, uh, we had our first, or a little more than a month ago, our first COVID-related event on how this was impacting Russian politics. Today's topic um, builds on that, uh, but also uh, uh, delves a little more specifically into the topic of Russian civil society and NGOs. It is no secret to this audience that Russian civil society has been facing um, substantial challenges and hurdles, uh, whether it's the lack of funding, whether it's new uh, restrictive laws, such as the foreign funding and then the desirable organizations law. Um, and yet at the same time, we've seen real adaptive techniques used by Russian civil society and NGOs um, in response. Uh, so the purpose of today's session is to examine how uh, NGOs have coped uh, with the COVID crisis. On the one hand, we've seen uh, the Russian state employ increasing measures of surveillance, um, uh, you know, technological uh, kind of monitoring uh, capabilities. We've seen, of course, uh, real challenges at the ground level in coping with the outbreak um, and different kinds of relationships between NGOs and local authorities and the federal government. Um, uh, and uh, on the other hand, um, you know, we still see um, a prominent role being played uh, by the sector. So uh, we have an incredible lineup today of academics and practitioners. Uh, I'm not going to introduce them. Uh, I'm going to turn things over now to my colleague, Josh, who will moderate the session and tell you a little bit more about everyone. Just in terms of the format today, we are on Zoom. We are on YouTube. Um, we are going to ask each of our speakers to go about eight to 10 minutes. And at about one o'clock, we'll start taking and fielding your questions. But again, thanks, everyone, speakers, for joining us. Thank you at home. And Josh, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks so much, Alex, for the introduction, and thanks, uh, thanks to, <clears throat> to our panelists for joining us today, and thanks for all of you for joining uh, the Harriman Institute and the NYU Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia for our latest installment of our New York City Russia Public Policy Series. Um, our first speaker today will be Sarah Lindemann Komarova, who began her career as a community development activist in 1992 using English classes for civic education at Novosibirsk University and was a founder of the Siberian Civic Initiative Support Center, the Siberian Network of NGO Community Development Resource Centers, the Regions Coalition, and the Russian Community School Movement. Currently, she's focused on research and writing, and her most recent piece is with co-author Deborah Javelin, Financing Russian Civil Society, and was published in Europe Asia Studies in 2019. Sarah, take it away. We need you to unmute yourself. Uh, well, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. I'm speaking to you from Novosibirsk, where it's uh, 11 o'clock at night. And uh, I want to thank the Harriman Institute and NYU for this opportunity to share my thoughts on this as with, with my colleagues that I'm excited to hear from. What I'm going to be doing is talking about NGO resource centers and how they've been responding to the COVID crisis and uh, what I'm, what I, the, what I'm, what I've come, what I'm going to be presenting to you is based on uh, survey work that the resource centers have been doing, as well as interviews I conducted with 
four of them from St. Petersburg, Arc Angels, Novosibirsk, and Krasnoyarsk. Uh, the survey work was done by Charities Aid Foundation, also Garant. So this is really sort of the ground floor of, of, of what's going on. And I'm not going to give you a lot of numbers because I know you're going to get a lot of numbers from other people tonight. What I want to try, what I'm trying to do is to capture uh, something that I think is a little bit more uh, exciting than the numbers because what I would say is this is the best of times and the worst of times. Now, the worst of times, everybody knows what we're talking about here. Uh, obviously, there's been an enormous economic hit uh, to the, the, the NGOs. Uh, the, the numbers confirm that. Uh, but the best of times because, and I thought, I thought maybe it's the nature of the beast with NGOs, but you know, there have always been headwinds. It has never been an easy time. So they are really, um, I remember a great quote from a community foundation guy from a village in, in, in Perm Krai who, who said, you know, we just don't spend our energy trying to break through. We find ways to go around. So that's what this has been sort of the ultimate challenge for, for the sector and for in particular these resource centers uh, because everyone, government, business, for the, is really looking for who can help, who can help. Nobody had any idea what to do and they look around and there were NGOs and there were resource centers uh, available. So uh, the word that I heard used most was talchok, push, that this was a real push for everybody. And uh, what was interesting is that, and I think it was best expressed by Anna Arlova in St. Petersburg, who she said, it was useful stress. She said, it's ideologically very helpful because you can't work the old way and survive. It forced NGOs to think about how they work, their resources, and, and their management practices. So they really, you know, people, there was a little bit of stagnation sort of in, in terms of making that next, next move forward. This forced everybody. Uh, Marina uh, Mihailovna in Archangel said, if you are professional, flexible, not afraid of learning new things like IT and competent, mission-driven, this is a great opportunity to grow in terms of partnership, visibility, and skills. You know, if you could solve a problem, uh, you were going to be in demand. So for the first time, really, NGOs were in demand from everybody. Um, CAF reported that most NGOs in their survey, which was, it was the beginning of June, most NGOs saw positive aspects in the situation. What was positive? They had time to work on organizational development, strategic planning, reducing costs, in enhancing fundraising. They had to start learning about how to do online fundraising, studying their target group needs, increased productivity. Quote, the majority of NGOs are optimistic about the future and want to plan new projects, new formats for service delivery, revise the essence of their work. Um, this is sort of obviously because the biggest push came for NGOs in terms of their using of IT, because if you couldn't move online, you were not going to survive this. And again, it was the great challenge for the NGO resource centers um, to provide the kind of training and events and networking that could really help these NGOs become part of the solution. And so, uh, uh, and it also what these, uh, what it indicated is the demand on the side of NGOs to uh, increase their professionalism, to increase their skills. So for example, Garant in Arcangos, they organized in, uh, in a 12 hour marathon, 45 minute seminars in a row. And the quality of both the content in terms of professionalism, but for NGOs, the real breakthrough was the technical quality. And 1,973 NGOs have viewed that, uh, some or all of this 12 hour marathon that was presented. St. Petersburg conducted two, these are just a couple of examples. St. Petersburg created a training program for how to work remote. 924 NGOs participated in that training program. They also did a training program on crisis management, 814 NGOs. These numbers were surprising to everyone. And what it shows is that the sector as a whole realizes that it's time to you know, get to that next step of being professional. Um, in terms of business, right? Because what big part of what these resource centers job is, is to get business and government to work in partnership. And I was, I looked at the, the donor forum, which is uh, a, a group of corporate and private foundations and um, 26 of the donor forum, 
former forum members mentioned NGOs or a foundation in their COVID response program. So what this means is that they're seeing NGOs as partners. You know, they're not just giving them money, but they're working together with them to design and implement programs in response to COVID. Um, 80% of NGOs reported that the, their private and corporate donations went down, but 20% said no deviation, slight growth, or significant growth. This is a huge difference between this and 2008. In 2008, the day after the crash, every corporate office just closed down their entire charity program. That's not happening now. Instead, they're turning to NGOs and saying, how can we work together and solve these problems? Uh, Sberbank has introduced a 2% loan program. Uh, the president's presidential uh, uh, grants organized a conference uh, on financial mechanisms for NGOs, which was really great. They had a couple of Western experts who came in, uh, were speaking, and then uh, the Fond Patan and Tim Chika Fond and Ilya Chukalin was uh, speaking uh, there. And uh, what people kept writing in is that they that they had all been turned down for Sberbank 2% loans. Turned down, turned down, turned down. Fast forward a couple of weeks and uh, the resource center in Perm, Svetlana Makovitska, announced that she got the 2% loan from Sberbank. Now, what that, not only did she get the loan, but then what these resource centers are doing, she took all the documents that she needed to get the loan, put them online so that other resource centers and NGOs can just copy those documents so two or three resource centers are already going for that. So this is the kind of sort of dynamic sharing and partnering that's happening. Now government, uh, Lena Malitsky in Novosibirsk at the Siberian Center said, it's a breakthrough on government attitudes because it revealed so many problems like the laws, uh, but also the role of NGOs overall. They saw the importance of the sector. So it really, you know, on the local level, who can help us? Well, there was this one group of people who could help. Um, there was a, a lot of praise for presidential grants and because they sort of also set a template for allowing NGOs to be flexible on their budgets and timelines and programs so that they could survive this. Uh, for, those, so that for those who have presidential grants, they're having not as difficult a time as those who do not. Um, another important, uh, I think, observation from, in terms of government, it came from Krasnoyarsk where, and the regions, the governments, for some of these governments in Novosibirsk, Krasnoyarsk, they saw a long time ago how useful, how uh, these resource centers are providing information to citizens and NGOs. So they set up government supported, financed re resource centers around these regions. Um, and the independent resource centers do the training. But what, the, what this COVID crisis did is it showed the difference to everyone between these government created resource centers and the independent resource centers because the independent, all the, the government ones were just turned to the end, independent guys for leadership. They were the ones that were creating leadership, showing leadership what to do. Um, so it also strengthened the role of these resource centers in terms of the government uh, because while the government resource centers had good skills, it's a completely different mindset. In a crisis, they were just sitting and waiting for somebody to tell them what to do and this was really sort of showtime final exam for, for these NGO resource centers. And they really have come through. And what they're doing is using this, this sort of period now as a group nationally, because, uh, yeah, well, Lena so, no, certainly is a part of this. Um, so it's really regional leaders, Moscow, St. Petersburg leaders, everybody has really strengthened these connections to address the concerns. What are the concerns? Government attitude. Why do we need to pay people? Everybody, again, this attitude about they should, you should all be just volunteers and no understanding that those volunteers require ad administrative effort. Um, the sector is very rich and diverse with all kinds of people addressing a wider range of issues. Now donors are shifting mandates to support COVID, meaning social service providers. So it starts to look like the 2000s. Leaders are mobilizing so that they can talk to donors about this because there's just too much focus on the social services aspect and not enough about sort of the wider range of NGOs um, and worries about politicization. Um, there's a lot of discussion. I'm sure Lynn will talk about it. Um, this, the idea of the NGO registry, because if you're on this registry, you get a lot of benefits now, tax breaks, etc. But um, 
one of the things that surfaced in the crisis is that the hardest hit NGOs are these uh, fee for service. They, they operate a lot, they're registered as NGOs, but they operate a lot like small businesses. Uh, they mostly are in the fields of education, culture, and sports. Very, a lot of what they did couldn't get moved online. And they, could, they didn't get in the registries because they were self, they, they survived on fee for services. Their clients have disappeared. They're not in the registry, so they can't get the benefits. So there's this whole sort of strong, important group of NGOs that, um, that is providing sort of ammunition now for this coalition, national coalition of resource centers to now start to get into. And, and what because they were able to respond so positively and effectively, to the, uh, the crisis, they sort of recognize this is their moment. They have a lot of power right now. And to start to push themselves further into that, the, 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 the ultimate goal, which is NGOs being an equal partner to government and business in creating you know, a democratic Russia. And so I think for these resource centers, and they already, I was sent yesterday, a thesis, a five point thesis on these points, how to address it, how to move forward uh, to push things forward. So um, the best of times, the worst of times, exciting. And nobody's getting enough sleep and everybody's sick of Zooming. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. I think nobody getting enough sleep and everybody's sick of Zooming is the official motto of 2020 at this point <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> Um, our next speaker will be Andre Semenov, who's a senior researcher at the Center for Comparative History and Politics at Perm State University in Russia and an associate research scholar at the Macmillan Center at Yale University here in the US. He studies opposition and mobilization, civic and urban activism, electoral and subnational politics in Russia. His most recent research appeared in Social Movement Studies and Democ Democratizatia, the Journal of Social Policy Studies and Sociological Studies Journals. Andre? Thanks, Josh. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I'll just set up my presentation, uh, the slides, to facilitate um, the um, communication. Yeah, everybody's sick of Zoom, but hopefully not not today. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, before I start, I think two uh, remarks I should uh, uh, tell you pr prior to my talk. One is that throughout uh, my talk, I'm going to refer to interviews and field works and polls. Uh, this work has been done with my colleague from the center, Sevla Vedersen, and as usual, all the best ideas are from him and uh, my, all mistakes are mine. Uh, and the second one, uh, the second remark is that I'm a political scientist and meaning uh, that uh, approaching the subject like civil society implies that uh, uh, we usually refer to the, inevitably we refer to the nature of political uh, regime and characterization of the political regime. I understand that not, uh, that not everyone uh, likes to label current political situation in Russia an authoritarian or electoral authoritarian, but I think uh, in, in some ways it helps us to think about, to, to, it gives us a necessary uh, context to understand the development of the uh, civil society uh, in countries like Russia. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to be, I, I try to be brief. Uh, I think my major argument uh, collates nicely with what Sarah started to now talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, organizational resilience or so the ability of the organizations to uh, cope with the exogenous shocks and environmental changes. And one, I think, major point uh, for those who study civil society in Russia is that over the last two decades, Russian civil society uh, went through a series of crises, uh, uh, including 2006 uh, legislative changes, the economic crisis in 2008 then uh, the uh, foreign agents law and the law on a desirable organization that Alex uh, also mentioned. And I think I definitely agree with Sarah that it also, it fostered uh, to a certain extent the ability of the organizations now of the uh, NGOs and civic initiatives uh, to uh, cope with the uh, uh, with this, this kind of crises, and I, uh, in our studies, we have identified at least three uh, major uh, sources of this resilience. One is the uh, organizational diversity within the field, the uh, diversity of the resource flows, and the dense interactions uh, within the communities or networks of civil society organizations. Just maybe to give you a context, back in the time when we studied the uh, response to uh, uh, the um, uh, foreign agents law, uh, um, uh, uh, many of our informants mentioned that the availability of different organizational forms uh, allowed them to uh, choose between different tactics and strategies. Uh, uh, some, for instance, preferred to go under the radar, meaning that they just uh, liquidated the uh, formal organization uh, and continued their activity uh, uh, within the framework of the informal uh, civic initiative or group. 
Uh, others uh, uh, went uh, professionalized and incorporated uh, their civic initiatives into the uh, 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 legal entities. And I think this availability of these different templates and uh, organizational forms is an important feature of the field where you can switch between uh, different modes of operation and adapt to the uh, situation. Now that surrounds you. The other thing is that uh, also in our interviews with the, with the informants, um, there was a, a continuing topic uh, about the um, uh, resource flows and the importance of uh, having this uh, diversity of the resource flows. Different funds come with different uh, conditionalities. And for instance, those who worked with the uh, public money, they mentioned that uh, the stringent requirements for spending and reporting uh, elevated their level of uh, uh, internal organizational management, but also the quality of services they delivered. Others, uh, for instance, those who work with the uh, crowdfunding campaigns or uh, uh, large networks of volunteers also mentioned that it, it sort of increased their organizational capacity. Uh, it uh, allowed them to develop necessary organizational uh, techniques and uh, skills. Uh, um, and there comes the, 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 uh, the third point. I think uh, for those who study civil society in Russia, it's just astonishing, uh, fascinating to observe the intensity of the interactions of the uh, uh, communication within the community. And here, uh, the uh, resource centers like uh, uh, Siberian Center or uh, communication hubs like uh, Agency for the Social Information that play, I think, a major role in facilitating this kind of information flows, expertise and knowledge that is necessary to uh, adapt to the changing environment and situation. So in short, I would say uh, I was not surprised that uh, Russian uh, civil society was uh, quite ready for the pandemic uh, when it stroke in late March. Here are just a couple of examples, I think astonishing again, examples of how this uh, civil society organization responded uh, to the crisis, uh, uh, fundraising money, uh, organizing these service deliveries to the uh, medics and uh, social workers, but also uh, to the most vulnerable groups uh, like, again, migrants and uh, homeless people, elderly, uh, etc. Uh, some even expanded their operations like Lana, Jurkinas, Don uh, and I think in a recent poll by uh, uh, CAF also half of the uh, out of 20 organizations uh, surveyed um, uh, mentioned, reported that they also expanded their operations during the crisis. So again, to put it in a context, we can recall that in 2010, the Russian civil society was the first to respond to the wildfires. In 2012, uh, there was a rapid response to the Krimsk uh, disaster, uh, to the flood in, in Krimsk. Uh, and again, this accumulated capacity, I think it's an important feature uh, of the civil society. So maybe again, to sum up, uh, I think uh, it stems from this uh, uh, accumulated resilience from the flexibility that, that the civil society organization can respond to these environmental changes. I think important thing about the uh, uh, NGOs is that they uh, uh, they have a vast experience with maximizing an output from the limited resources they have. They, they are socialized in an environment, as Sarah mentioned, uh, in the environment with a scarcity of resources. And then they can really make a difference out of any rebel or any volunteer that uh, are in their networks. And uh, uh, maybe on the top of that, I think there is there are uh, definitely signs of uh, growing linkages with the citizens. Maybe to give you one uh, piece of evidence here, uh, this is a wonderful data coming from now, uh, Mitya Aleshkovsky, uh, uh, Need Need for Help um, initiative, the benchmarking NGOs. It's the monthly averages of donation of private donations to uh, the list of organizations that are included in this project. And you can see, I think, so the solid black line is the average uh, across the types of organization. Of course, there is the variation. You can see that environmental organizations in green, there is a steady uh, uh, um, uh, increase in the donations uh, for the social help. There is much more. Uh, 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 there is much more volatility. But in general, I think what is astonishing, if you zoom in the last uh, three months, uh, uh, March, April, May, there is no a major drop in the private donations to the organization. Meaning that society, I think in general, trusts uh, the uh, civil uh, society organizations, NGOs, and is eager to donate money, is eager to support uh, these organizations uh, when time uh, is, uh, when time comes. Um, but before I think we, we, we start feeling too optimistic, I think the flip side of the uh, situation is that uh, the organizational resilience is uneven across the field. Uh, somewhere else, we argued with uh, Sevola that uh, it depends on the organizational niches, but I'm not going, uh, I'm going to go there. I'll be happy to uh, take maybe Q&As on that. I think uh, maybe a more general point is that uh, the state policy towards the preferential access to the public funds 
uh, uh, to uh, the, and the labeling uh, organizations into to like partners with the state and the foreign agents or whatever uh, into the sort of trustful organization versus distrustful. I think this uh, uh, it take it, it undermines uh, uh, essentially the sources of resilience. Now it reduces the organizational diversity and stimulates specific uh, types of activity. Uh, and I think this is. This is the flip side of the situation uh, right now. Maybe again, to give you one piece of evidence uh, from the interview with the uh, informant back in 2015, one organization, Resource Center, uh, uh, when we discussed the, uh, um, the uh, um, public funding, the, the, the growth in public funding from presidential grants or from uh, Ministry of Economic Development uh, subsidies, uh, the informant told us that, well, it's good to have public funds rising. It's uh, definitely a good, uh, sign, but uh, it's like a needle. Uh, it comes with a uh, require. It, it comes with a, a certain conditionalities, uh, and for some organization, it means that other alternatives are sort of cut off. Uh, they are off the table, and uh, you have to concentrate uh, more on other things than uh, uh, than your or, uh, initial organizational purposes. So there is a danger uh, in these kind of things. And maybe to sum up, uh, 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 my argument would be that after all, we see that over the last two decades in civil society. Now, accumulated this impressive organizational knowledge and expertise that allowed to rapidly respond to uh, COVID-19. Um, some say it's even uh, uh, better than the government did. Um, so uh, it allowed also to survive uh, these hard times. But continuing attitization, uh, uh, if I were to put this uh, word, uh, coupled with this preferential access and uh, labeling, uh, I think this, uh, 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 this can undermine uh, further or aggravate further the divisions within the field and uh, undermine the same sources of resilience that make the civil society in Russia strong and um, growing. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andre. <coughs> um, our next speaker is going to be Valerie Sperling, who's a professor of political science at Clark University. Uh, her research interests lie largely at the intersection of Russian politics and gender studies. She's a co-author of Courting Gender. She's a co <laughs> she's a co-author of Courting Gender uh, Justice: Russia, Turkey, and the European Court of Human Rights, which was published by Oxford University Press in two nine 2019, and the author of Sex Politics and Putin: Political Legitimacy in Russia, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2015. This latter book won the Association for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies, affectionately known to most of you as ACES, the Davis Center Book Prize for the outstanding monograph on Russian, Eurasian, or East Europe in Anthropology, Political Science, Sociology, or Geography as well as the Association for Women in Slavic Studies Health Prize for the best book in Slavic, East European, Eurasian Women's Studies. Valerie, it's a pleasure to have you here. Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, and thank, thank you, Josh and Alex and Sasha and Carly for organizing this panel and directing attention to civil society and activism. So I'm gonna talk specifically about activism against domestic violence in Russia and what kinds of issues have been raised on that front during the COVID-19 pandemic. Domestic violence is obviously an issue that predated the pandemic in Russia. Feminist groups for decades have tried to draw more societal attention to this really quite widespread problem and have made something like 40 attempts since the mid 1990s to pass a law on domestic violence in Russia. The first domestic violence hotline and women's crisis center got started in the 1990s and interestingly, these are some of the feminist organizations that have persisted in Russia providing this very necessary service uh, to women who are suffering domestic violence, and also raising popular consciousness about an issue that had been largely taboo during the Soviet era. Whereas in the 1990s, journalists began to write about domestic violence, um, and there was some, but not very much, street protest on the issue of domestic violence. In recent years, there's been a lot more visible activism on that topic. In part, the visibility of this issue in recent years in Russia was due to several particularly brutal and sensationalized cases of domestic violence or family violence. In December, 2017, uh, Margarita Grachova's husband took her into the woods and chopped off both of her hands with an ax. He had previously accused her of cheating on him and threatened her with a knife, but when Grachova turned to the police for help, they didn't take it seriously. Um, the second recent case of family violence garnering enormous public attention um, was that of the Kachaturian sisters, three teenagers living in Moscow who killed their father 
in July 2018 after years of suffering physical and sexual violence at his hands. The case brought out the details of the violence and again, the details of police in action. So that when the daughters were charged with murder and faced the possibility of 20 year jail sentences for their act of self-defense, people went into the streets to protest. And then in November of last year, the public was shocked again when it emerged that a 24 year old student at St. Petersburg State University had been killed and dismembered by her partner, who was also her history professor. He was caught when trying to rid himself of her body parts in the Moika River. Changes in the law relating to domestic violence have also helped draw more attention uh, to this issue. The partial decriminalization of domestic battery in February of 2017 was an impetus to, for new organizing to push for a law on domestic violence. Making use of social media to spread the word, feminist activists like Aliona Popova mobilized people to support a law that would recognize domestic violence and establish protection orders, uh, remedial courses for perpetrators, and statewide training for police on domestic violence issues. By October 2019, her petition in support of a domestic violence law had over 800,000 signatures. At the end of November, a watered down draft of the law was published and spurred some controversy with ultra conservatives um, and the Russian Orthodox Church opposing the law arguing that it was a plot by feminists and other nefarious actors to destroy the Russian nation. Um, but the pandemic put a stop to those discussions. On April 22nd, when asked about the draft law, Valentina Matvienko, who's the speaker of the Federation Council, said that Russia's legislators would, would return to discussions of the domestic violence bill after the pandemic had passed. Um, as she put it, quote, I doubt there'll be a spike in domestic violence. On the contrary, families are going through this tough period together. Uh, but Matvienka was wrong about that. Uh, the pandemic, which confined families to their dwellings, made matters considerably worse. Um, fears that domestic violence would increase during the pandemic were raised early on by Russian activists when the shutdown was imposed um, at the end of March. Women who had planned to escape their abusers wouldn't be able to do so because their partners were never out of the house at work or on a business trip, which are usually strategic times for women to leave more safely. Moreover, the activists pointed out that the quarantine had made it harder for women to get help from the police. Um, police stations were closed to the public Police were primarily concerned with maintaining the quarantine. On April 2nd, within days of lockdown, a group of nine NGOs working with domestic violence victims wrote an open letter to the government with an urgent request to protect and support vulnerable people, including domestic violence victims. They noted that most cities lacked domestic violence shelters and those that had them lacked space. Oksana Pushkina, the Duma deputy who's been an ally on these issues, pointed out on March 30th that there were only about 15 state-run crisis centers for victims of domestic violence and that many of these had closed due to the quarantine regulations. And activist concerns in this regard were not misplaced. On May 5th, Russia's human rights commissioner, Tatyana Moskalkova, announced that domestic violence incidents that were reported to Russian NGOs had more than doubled since the lockdown began in late March. In response to this escalation, the Anna Center, Russia's only national hotline for victims of domestic violence, expanded their hours to accommodate the escalating numbers of calls. Um, in a sense, the COVID pandemic and the lockdown put a spotlight on a growing societal concern about domestic violence. And while Russian NGOs and activists on social media may have impressive, although limited reach um, on this issue within Russia, Pussy Riot, the feminist punk collective that had made such a splash in Russia with their anti-Putin songs back in 2011 and 2012, they have also turned to the subject of domestic abuse in their latest work. Although whether that helps the cause or earns more negative attention on balance might be hard to say. Um, specifically, one of their new music videos called Knife uh, was released in mid-May during the lockdown. In the song, Nadia Talakonikova sings from the perspective of a woman who fantasizes about violently retaliating against her abusive male partner. 
The setting for the song, as you can see, is an animated video game featuring a female avatar wearing an anti-COVID face mask uh, with a Molotov cocktail, a knife, a can of spray paint, and a traditional pussy riot balaclava in her arsenal. Um, but even while public attention to domestic violence has reached a new high, it's clear that Russian activists working on this issue have a lot of societal inertia to overcome. Just as an example, in early March, the popular Russian TV show Comedy Club ran a skit that seemed to mock the entire concept of domestic violence. The skit featured a heterosexual couple discussing how to spend the coming weekend. Um, the two of them taking turns suggesting various things to do. While the perpetually smiling woman in the couple proposes various kinds of shopping activities, her husband counters with proposals that rhyme and that entail him beating or killing her in a variety of ways. So when she suggests they visit Ikea, he counters that maybe she'd like him to break her neck instead. When she notes that first they should drop by the ATM, the bancomat, he counters by suggesting that he could shoot her with an optomat. Their brief series of exchanges in the skit take place against the background of raucous audience laughter at each of the man's violent proposals. So where does this leave us? Should we be optimistic or pessimistic about the effects of the pandemic on Russian civil society organizing on domestic violence? While the pandemic has made life more dangerous for many women and disrupted the day-to-day -day operations of domestic violence shelters and increased the workload of crisis hotlines, the publicity around domestic violence that predated the pandemic has hopefully brought societal interest in this issue to a new level. The question is whether that momentum can be sustained through the length of the pandemic, especially given the many constraints on protest and the tendency for quote unquote women's issues to be placed on the back burner as they typically are during times of national crisis. Um, that's where I'll leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Valerie, for that presentation. Um, I just want to remind everybody in the audience that you can use the Q&A on the Zoom webinar if you want to ask questions now. We won't interrupt the speakers at this point, but if there are questions that you think of while individual speakers are talking, you can put the questions there and we'll, we'll get to them later. Uh, same thing for people on YouTube. You can use the comment section on YouTube if you have a question that you want to write. Uh, we have two more of speakers before we move on to Q and A, and our first and our next speaker now is Elena Topleva uh, Soldunova, who is the director of the autonomous nonprofit nonprofit organization Agency for Social Information. She's been a member of the public chamber of the Russian Federation since 2012, and has served as chair of the public chamber's commission on the development of the nonprofit sector and support for socially oriented nonprofit organizations since 2014. She's also served on the Expert Council under the government of the Russian Federation since 2012. And in 2013, she became the chair of the Public Council of the Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Protection. Elena? Uh, hi to everyone and uh, many thanks for organizing this panel and for inviting me to speak. Uh, it was a big uh, break for me. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I didn't speak any English for many years, so sorry for my <laughs> mistakes and pronunciation, but I'll, to, uh, I'll try to do my best. <laughs> uh, so um, I, will, I will speak about uh, uh, measures of support that were introduced by uh, our Russian authorities. Uh, uh, just to support uh, NGOs that uh, were affected by pandemic uh, and how we managed to get these measures and uh, to um, just uh, to have them because it was not easy. Uh, uh, as uh, Sarah and other colleagues uh, mentioned, uh, Russian NGOs immediately responded uh, to the problems occurred in connection with the COVID pandemic and uh, forced isolation and they very uh, just briefly uh, transformed their activities. They started suing masks, helping the elderly uh, people and homeless people and other people in need, uh, even doing things that they never did before. Uh, but they faced problems themselves. Not, uh, not um, all of them, but many of them especially those uh, who were providing services to people, that kind of services that were could not be transformed to um, distant forms uh, and online forms. Uh, 
also uh, charitable foundations, those NGOs that uh, provided trainings, uh, sport trainings, uh, cultural events, and and other things that were not be could not be um, uh, transformed to online forms. Uh, and uh, in the Agency for Social Information, we were covering uh, on everyday basis all these uh, new activities of NGOs and also problems that were uh, that they are facing and that they were facing. Uh, and uh, uh, interestingly, that uh, as also my colleague said, this time is really the worst of time and the best of time <laughs> because, for instance, for our agency, it was not a problem to um, just to change uh, the form of our activity and uh, um, all the, or change all things and, and make them in online format on distant format and even our website and uh, our media uh, became twice popular uh, in this in this time of pandemic than before though we, we had now we have two uh, times more visitors of our website um probably because we um, we were trying to uh present all the uh, acute information uh and about ngos the about that they were doing and also about the measures of uh, support that were uh, introduced to them um but in the public chamber we also organized the hotline for ngos and on everyday basis we were um getting dozens of uh, uh, emails of letters from NGOs where they were telling us uh, about their new activities and about their new problems. Uh, so uh, we immediately uh, understood that uh, uh, NGOs are also have to, to get measures of support uh, similar to those that uh, were introduced to medium and small enterprises. Actually, uh, after even several weeks of uh, uh, shutdown, uh, the, the president uh, announced uh, measures of support to uh, medium and small businesses, enterprises. Uh, then in, in, in two other weeks, new measures of support and so on and so forth. And so each time we were listening, you know, to TV, to the media and waiting when we when we when we uh, hear about uh, uh, measures of support to NGOs, but uh, there were no measures of support to our sector. And uh, uh, what we found out that while the sector uh, now uh, is uh, familiar to all, I don't know, officials, government officials, they all collaborate with NGOs, but uh, in their eyes, it was not obvious for them. It, it was, uh, it occurred to be difficult to uh, explain them why NGOs also need support uh, from the government because in their eyes uh, this sector is uh, supported by uh, budget money that uh, NGOs get from presidential fund for as presidential grants as uh, grants for, from on regional and uh, municipal level uh, but uh, you know while yes uh, many NGOs really get this money but not all of them of course and also even those who get this money uh, many of them they also get uh, uh, have other sources of uh, uh, financing like uh, donations from uh, private donors from corporates uh, and also uh, fees from service provision uh, but uh, it took us about a month uh, to convince uh, authorities in our country in necessity to help uh, the sector, the NGOs. Uh, and uh, finally, we managed to do this. Uh, and some of the uh, measures of support even exceeded our expectations. Uh, for, for instance, uh, during the last, uh, about last 20 years, uh, the sector was uh, just trying to convince authorities to provide income tax deduction for companies that donate funds to non-profits uh, like you know that uh, uh, such a um, measure exists in many countries but not in russia um, and now we managed to do this while uh, we even could not believe in this but now we have this uh, uh, income tax deduction for companies it's not like huge uh, thing but 
uh, for the sector and for business as well is uh, very important. Uh, and we have it now on a legislative level. Uh, we also uh, now have uh, exemptions for part of taxes and in insurance premiums uh, of that uh, NGOs, not all of them, but some of them that are now in special lists uh, uh, that are uh, were um, uh, that were uh, made by the Ministry of uh, Economics of uh, the Russian Federation. So those NGOs they are uh, exempted from these uh, taxes and insurance premiums for the second quarter. And also, as Sarah mentioned, they can get uh, uh, subsidized loans. Uh, that means that uh, they could they could uh, try to get uh, this two percent loan. But if uh, in uh, in twelve months uh, they still have the the same level of employment in their organization, uh, they can uh, they are this loan just uh, turns to be uh, like a subsidy like a grant so you should not uh, return it back to the bank uh, so many NGOs that are trying now to get this loan but uh, it's not so easy actually <laughs> uh, but uh, it's interesting that um, the, the process of uh, affirming uh, uh, authorities to, to introduce these measures of support uh, was very interesting, and I think it even uh, actually I I wish to uh, sometimes to describe this the whole process because because it was something very unusual. Uh, many different players came together just to uh, just to get these measures in place, and I I I could. Uh, hardly imagine this company <laughs> playing together in one team <laughs> uh, just in, in, in any other circumstances uh, because I could just uh, um, give some examples uh, so these players were uh, public chamber of the Russian federations uh, the state Duma uh, the, the, the committee of the state Duma on uh, cooperation with uh, uh, religious and uh, public organizations uh, Council of the Federation, All Russia Popular Front, United Russia Party, uh, Presidential Council for the Development of Civil Society and Human Rights, um, different NGO associations like All Together and Donors Forum and many others, uh, just different um, charitable, private charitable foundations and interestingly business associations that for me, it was actually uh, just very important to know that uh, business also uh, remember about NGOs and uh, presidential or uh, just members of these business associations uh, were the first uh, people who raised this issue uh, of, uh, to authorities uh, about the necessity to support uh, NGOs uh, not only uh, medium and small enterprises uh, like it was uh, uh, implemented in the first days uh, after this uh, pandemic and uh, shutdown. Uh, so after all these uh, forces uh, came together and we were writing a lot of uh, letters, we were organizing public hearings, we were just um, speaking to different authorities and doing a lot of different things uh, and uh, while, uh, for instance, I was feeling that I could not um, insist on some of the measures uh, in the walls of public chamber, then I turned to, for instance, I don't know, All Russian Popular Front or um, State Duma, and they, in their turn, they also uh, were, were trying to do their best to introduce these um, uh, measures of support. So it was in uh, so it was amazing example of cooperation between these very different players, uh, and uh, it's a good sign that all these players they they really now understand the uh, important role of uh, non-profit organizations uh, in in Russia. Uh, that's for uh, all together we forced uh, the authorities, the president, and the government, 
and they uh, finally introduced it, uh, the, those measures of NGO support uh, that uh, I believe uh, will help many of them. Uh, unfortunately, and in, in the end, I just wanted to add that uh, while it was also very difficult to elaborate these measures, uh, also because uh, we found out that the whole sector is very badly uh, described, that we don't have any good statistics about uh, the sector. We don't know uh, for sure how many people uh, are employed in NGOs, what taxes uh, different NGOs pay, uh, how many NGOs uh, work in different spheres. So uh, we found out that we don't have these statistics and that's why it was very d difficult to uh, show the government what kind of NGOs uh, should be supported firstly. Uh, that's why probably it was not the best way that was chosen because um, uh, the government finally decided to support uh, firstly those NGOs who uh, get different types of uh, this governmental support because those NGOs are already kind of a, a little bit more transparent and un understandable for uh, governmental uh, structures while um, also all types of charitable foundations that were uh, providing their reports to Ministry of Justice according to the law for uh, the last two years they also got all these measures of support and those who uh, provides a different type of social and educational services but there are some kinds of NGOs that unfortunately um, didn't get uh, this support um, also, I think the main reason for this is not just some somebody's just uh, um, bad will, but it was uh, just because of this uh, uh, less of uh, data about uh, NGO sector in Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, our final speaker will be Denise Volkov, who joined the Levada Center, an independent Moscow-based polling organization, as an analyst and head of the department in 2007. Since then, he has participated in more than 100 quantitative and qualitative research projects as a researcher, analyst, or organizer. He served as the deputy director of the center since 2019, and he's authored publications with particular focus on civil society, protest activities, elections, and political attitudes of the general public, as well as that of young people, business, and elites in Russia. He's a columnist at Venomosti, RBC, the Moscow Times, Forbes.ru, Carnegie, and Carnegie.ru of the Carnegie Moscow Center. Denise? Uh, thank you, Joshua. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm glad to join uh, a company of such interesting uh, experts and also join some, uh, some of my thoughts about on, the, on this topic. I will speak uh, uh, about the overall conditions uh, that, uh, that that are provided by the uh, pandemic and the quarantine and that uh, the events that coincided uh, uh, with it and the aftermath were well, not only on uh, Russian NGOs but as a civil society more broadly also on just groups of people who are ready to defend uh, uh, their rights. So uh, I think one uh, uh, first uh, important uh, condition is that uh, the pandemic, the quarantine uh, in Russia coincided with the start of economic crisis, uh, which already was uh, uh, unfolding in March uh, this year after the uh, oil uh, prices uh, collapsed and the ruble was uh, started to go down. So uh, we uh, we. So uh, we saw that uh, the quarantine increased uh, the uh, already existing uh, and unfolding problems uh, that of worsening economic conditions that people were uh, losing their jobs and uh, losing their profits. According to our uh, uh, polling, uh, one uh, third of uh, uh, population was affected uh, by this. And so uh, all these economic uh, troubles it led, uh, it led to, uh, uh, to the conflict, uh, labor conflicts, and uh, 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 for example, uh, Pyotr Bezukov, a very good expert on labor conflict um, uh, in uh, Russia, he is uh, writing about that May 
uh, May, which was a month uh, uh, just uh, 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 during the quarantine, uh, it uh, already saw uh, 70, 74 labor conflicts, which is a very big number, bigger than uh, uh, in any given month for several years. Uh, so in spite of uh, uh, quarantine, uh, people were uh, voicing their uh, protests uh, and uh, tried to uh, defend their uh, labor rights. So this, I think, uh, uh, this, uh, the aftermath of uh, uh, this worsening uh, economic conditions is, no, is not only that people are suffering, but also, I guess, the businesses try to um, uh, cut on uh, people, uh, on people's salaries and so on. So this is a conflict situation created by this uh, crisis and, uh, and quarantine, which was incre uh, increased and reinforced uh, by quarantine. Also, uh, we see that uh, NGOs as organizations suffered, uh, though uh, I guess uh, there is the list uh, which Yelena was talking about, no, but not, uh, uh, of course, every organization uh, 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 in Russia, uh, NGO organization is on this list. Uh, and uh, some, some organization uh, will suffer just the overall uh, economic, uh, uh, worsening economic conditions. Uh, what, what else? Uh, as we uh, uh, had this quarantine, it's the, another uh, aftermath and the result of this quarantine is uh, the ban on, uh, uh, on uh, public gatherings, which is, uh, I mean, that, uh, uh, that authorities imposed um, uh, on, uh, on the country, uh, which is uh, probably the, uh, uh, maybe, maybe a good thing to do, but at the same time, of course, it limit, uh, not only protects uh, uh, people's lives, but also uh, limits uh, activities, uh, uh, civic activities and protest activities. And I would say that this ban, um, because of this ban, uh, positional uh, politicians and people who were uh, against uh, the amendments to the constitution, uh, that was uh, the, the voting was taking place right after the uh, quarantine, right after this uh, 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 COVID, uh, COVID quarantine in Russia. And uh, uh, usually the uh, mass gatherings of uh, people who not support uh, uh, authorities, it's a very uh, important tool to uh, organize, to uh, build up uh, uh, strength and the argument. Uh, so it's uh, a good for people to organize these uh, uh, public events. And the, the lack of public uh, uh, such public events, uh, it uh, I would say, because of this uh, position, uh, uh, oppositional uh, activist leaders, opposition-minded public suffered, and was not uh, uh, able to organize and uh, uh, propose, um, offer meaningful alternative to the official uh, official strategy, which is uh, to go and vote for. Uh, the, uh, uh, these amendments. So uh, I guess this ban uh, contributed to uh, to this, mm, mm, and uh, this is the uh, aftermath of uh, after aftermath of uh, uh, quarantine. Uh, uh, in spite of this, uh, in spite of this ban, we see that the protest uh, moods are uh, on the level of the previous year, which is about uh, one quarter of the public. Uh, are saying that they are ready to uh, voice the dissatisfaction of the uh, of the government of the situation and uh, of uh, uh, with rising uncertainty, which uh, a pandemic also provided. Uh, so uh, and um, uh, so we see this uh, protest potential, and but there is a, a new to uh, to this situation. Uh, according to our polls, it's the first of all the youngest. Uh, people now who are the most uh, uh, eager to go and voice the uh, dissatisfaction. So we see this growing gap uh, between the older generations and younger generations uh, in Russia, who interestingly, for the first time in uh, many years, 
uh, uh, so uh, show some uh, uh, well bigger protest uh, potential than uh, other um, other generations. So this is a new problem. I'm not quite sure that it is connected directly uh, uh, to the uh, uh, COVID situation, but it uh, 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 it is connected with this um, um, dissatisfaction with the authorities. Uh, uh, which I think also the, uh, the effect of the worsening economic conditions and also these political, political events, uh, the changing of constitution. So this is, uh, 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 this is new situation and very interesting to, uh, to see uh, how it will uh, develop. Uh, uh, in spite of this, uh, in spite of this ban, and uh, uh, already during the um, uh, during the uh, quarantine, we see that uh, uh, journalists, a very vibrant and active community uh, in Russia of uh, persons who defend uh, their rights and uh, try to defend the free of speech, uh, they were already were uh, trying to defend uh, uh, their colleagues that uh, suffered. Uh, uh, pressure from the government. Uh, we saw a single, uh, how is it, uh, the, uh, single vigilant, uh, like single pickets uh, uh, of journalists uh, in support of ombudsmen of uh, police. Kind of, and it's a Telegram channel here, uh, in, uh, uh, and it was happening in May already. So uh, 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 during the quarantine. Uh, we saw, uh, we see, and uh, we see just seen the the wave of support in of uh, support of uh, Svetlana Prokopio from uh, uh, Echo uh, in Pskov, Echo Moscow Radio, Echo Moscow in Pskov, and now we are experiencing this uh, uh, support uh, uh, to uh, Ivan uh, Safronov, uh, former um, former journalist of Commerçant and uh, Pyotr Vyazilov, all uh, those uh, people uh, felt the pressure of the, uh, of the authorities. And we see how journalists, uh, this very small but active community, still tries to uh, defend their colleagues. And again, this is very similar to the, uh, to the uh, previous year. So uh, quarantine didn't uh, stop this. And, uh, 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 didn't have this uh, much effect on the uh, civic, uh, civic civic sphere uh, in Russia. And uh, uh, what is, I think, well, uh, Valerie has already covered uh, brilliantly the topic of, uh, uh, of uh, domestic violence, which is uh, absolutely uh, uh, the um, well, increase in this uh, violence, uh, absolutely the uh, uh, aftermath of uh, the result of quarantine. But um, I would like uh, to end on uh, 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 such, a, um, such an issue that uh, all this uh, growing uncertainty, uh, political uh, uh, turbulences and economic turbulences, it uh, um, uh, uh, results, it, it results in the uh, uh, gr uh, um, decreasing support uh, of the authorities, decreasing trust in uh, uh, state institutions, and in uh, such circumstances, uh, Russians tend to be more active, uh, more uh, 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 willing to defend their rights uh, in a sense that uh, they already do not have uh, by default trust uh, in the authorities and try to uh, defend for, uh, for defend their rights and try to uh, become active. So, in this sense, I think uh, uh, this uh, quarantine uh, and the economic uh, uh, troubles uh, because of uh, economic crisis and quarantine it will lead in the um, uh, pros uh, and longer prospect in a more active uh, civil society, which is not limited to just to angels, but uh, is more about uh, uh, broader groups of people who are ready to uh, defend their rights and solve uh, uh, their problems uh, together. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you, Denise. And thanks to all of our, uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we're going to turn to questions in, uh, now. And I want to remind again, people in the audience uh, on the Zoom channel, you can use the Q&A to pose questions and people who are on YouTube can use the comments on YouTube to pose questions. However, I want to give a special shout out uh, at this moment to uh, Sasha Spitalnik, who is the program administer, uh, administrator at the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at NYU. And it was Sasha's idea to originally put this panel Panel together when we were discussing planning for these New York City Russia public policy series, because she has actually just recently completed a senior thesis on the subject of Russian NGOs. And so she was eager to hear, and she's suggested many of the people who are here today, eager to hear um, from them. And so I'd like to pass and give Sasha the first question, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Alex for the next one. Thank you so much, Josh. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. This was an absolutely fascinating panel. I couldn't have imagined a better outcome for the event. Um, have a sort of large question that's made up of a few different questions. And so hope, I thought that this would make it possible for multiple people to respond. Uh, so first, I wanted to ask, um, what do you believe that this period of growth and collaboration as well as challenges might mean for the relationship between uh, NGOs and the public at large. Uh, I was wondering if this period at the very least uh, has it brought more attention to socially oriented NGOs and their capacity to fill in the gaps in government social services and in contrast um, what organizations have been most negatively impacted by this period and are there those who you believe won't be able to come back from this or um, have connections between NGOs and resource centers, as well as government support or business support, assisted in supporting organizations like this. And in that question, I was thinking of organizations that might work with uh, more marginalized groups, stigmatized groups, such as the LGBTQ plus community, or people who inject drugs, for example, that are at risk of um, developing HIV or other diseases. Um, so thank you very much. Looking forward to your answers. <laughs> Sarah, do you want to respond? Yeah, um, I think that um, in terms of March, I, I, I have a, I think that again, the, 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 those, the organizations that can think creatively, think out of the box, regardless of what their mission or mandate is. A great example is an organization I, I know, uh, you know, uh, humanitarian, humanitarian project in Novosibirsk, which provides uh, support to AIDS Victims, and they have support from all kinds of sources, both Western and government, uh, et cetera. But um, what they, uh, they came up with this idea of using wild berries, which is you know, the private box boxes uh, to, to, to provide delivery of AIDS tests and medicines so, so that people who are under quarantine, you know, who couldn't come into the office. So I think it isn't even so much about what the, what the missions are, it's about an attitude about being creative. Um, I, I was told a great example in, in St. Petersburg of an organization that what they decided to do was to, to get children, uh, disabled children out of internats so that they could be safe from COVID and place them in homes. And it got some, so it was sort of this great combination of then the press got involved, then the public heard about them, then donors got interested in what they were doing. So the organizations that really got creative and thought out of the box, even those that had challenging sort of target groups to work with, I think I'll just repeat, the hardest hit turns out to be its culture, education and sports uh, who were providing services because they're not on the registries uh, and their client base, you know, they can't go online. You know, they've tried, it, it, a lot of it isn't working. But the statistic that CAF put out in the service, and this is as of the first week of, of June, is that only 5% of NGOs have suspended work. So that's a pretty good, you know, uh, now what, uh, what I've heard from different experts I was talking to is that smaller groups are sleeping and they'll wake up when it's over kind of thing. Um, and so there is a wide range. Everybody's taking, well, almost everybody's taking a hit, but I think, I think really the, the, the big headline is really how it has pushed them into pushing themselves further, more creatively, increasing their skills and, and, and realizing that they need to think about long-term financial planning and not go project to project. And that includes diversifying um, income sources. I saw there was a question about income sources uh, on, the, on the list. And 
Um, I think that's what been one of the big, the organizations that are surviving better are those that had more diversified sources. So um, whether it's donations, paid services, presidential grants, business donations, dues, regional subsidies, government. So that's, um, and I, I think that sort of, that applies to everybody. So I don't know if that um, answers your question, but somewhat. Um, you have, do any of the other? Yeah, Alina, absolutely. Yeah, I would probably add to what Sarah mentioned that uh, I hope that um, uh, NGOs that uh, were affected by pandemic and didn't get uh, any this governmental support measures, uh, I hope that they also could uh, get some support from uh, non-governmental organizations and some of them Sarah mentioned and um, unfortunately um many private foundations uh, not many actually but uh, there are some private foundations in in uh, russia that just immediately after uh, this uh, pandemic crisis uh, uh, introduced to ngos new grant programs it was not only uh, presidential grants fund uh, that also introduced now just the anti pandemic uh, new uh, competition for NGOs uh, that uh, were affected by pandemic, but also uh, some, some private foundations, some big foundations and also small foundations. For instance, uh, when we were getting um, emails from NGOs uh, in uh, the public chamber and uh, those NGO NGOs were asking for support, then we just um, we, we uh, these letters were uh, were sent by uh, the chamber to Smirnov's foundation, uh, Vladimir Smirnov's foundation. Uh, they also had some this anti-crisis uh, uh, small grant scheme, and they actually very in very very shortly in uh, without any just new um, pr process of but. Uh, uh, in in very brief uh, uh, period of time, they took decisions and supported many local small NGOs that uh, suffered from pandemic. Uh, Andre, you want a quick comment? You want to make as well? Yeah, thanks, Sasha, for the question. I think it's it's very relevant uh, to the topic uh, on on the public. I think the connections with the public uh, 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 of the civil society, as I mentioned in my talk, I think it's the strongest ever. So we see it in the polls. Uh, last year, CAF also conducted the survey where half of the uh, respondents uh, reported that they donated money and the median donation was 3,000 rubles, which I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very important achievement of the sector itself to establish these linkages with the citizens. But having uh, said this, I think the easiest answer to your question about who's going to suffer the most, uh, of course, I think, you know, in the long run, the strongest will survive. Those with the uh, stronger political connections, those uh, with a, a diverse, more diverse funding, those with much more expertise. Uh, and, you know, our approach, for instance, with uh, Seattle, uh, is that uh, the, the, those who has uh, sort of limited access to the resources and also uh, has uh, um, like less resources in general, uh, they, they, they're going to suffer the most. LGBTQ, uh, exactly, they're in this niche. Maybe environmental organizations as well are moving in that, in that directions. Uh, and again, to put it in a context, out of, I think, uh, now the estimate is 200,000 NGOs in Russia, well, plus or minus, and only 30,000 uh, are on the list of Ministry of Economic Development for the subsidies for, on this relief package, let's put it this way. So uh, 30,000 uh, uh, out of 200,000, well, I think, yeah, the rest is anyway has to deal uh, with the crisis in itself. So it's going to be some, uh, ex if, if not extinction, but some uh, uh, decline in the activity in the long run, uh, I would say. So let's take the next question from uh, Svetlana Borodina, who is now a postdoctoral uh, scholar at the Harriman Institute. And she asks uh, whether um, the pandemic has affected the discourse and practice of volunteerism in Russia. Um, what are the new trends and continuities and how different stakeholders speak and go about volunteering? Are there new forms of volunteering or supportive infrastructure? 
And uh, why don't we start with Valerie on that one and then any of our other speakers want to weigh in are, are welcome to do so. Okay, thank you. Um, it's wonderful to hear everybody's talks. That was, uh, that was great, and very enlightening. Um, you know, I'm not sure I can say anything intelligent about comparing volunteerism, you know, during the pandemic and before the pandemic, you know, we're really talking about a sort of short period of time. And in some ways, right, the people who are available to do volunteering are always going to be the same. They're going to be the people who have some resources to be able to, to do that or who have some time, you know, to do that. One, one thing we might want to consider is the different forms that, you know, that sort of activism or volunteering um, might take. So, for example, not all of civil society organizing is in the form of NGOs, right? If I look at, you know, the, um, the sector that, you know, I, I pay the most attention to, which would be, you know, feminist organizing, you know, yes, you have some organizations that have persisted for a long time, let's say, like the Committee of Soldiers Mothers that you know, exists on a voluntary basis and that's what they do. And they get a lot of, you know, they get a lot of people um, involved, but the, but there are less formalized uh, types of civil society activism that don't have to be slowed down uh, by a pandemic or may not be affected, you know, by the pandemic at all. And that's um, the sort of organizing that you would see on social media, you know, whether it's informing people, raising public consciousness, about domestic violence or about um, sexism or about sexist language, you know, those kinds of um, efforts use social media uh, to get the word out. And, you know, and of course it's also volunteering, you know, it's also people taking their time. Um, but anyway, I thought I would just make that distinction. Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to take up this question of volunteerism and then volunteering? Uh, Lena or Sarah? Yeah. Um, this is actually a really important issue because what's great about, again, another great thing about the COVID is that it really brings everything to the surface and forces people to deal with it. And one of the key issues that the resource centers have been grappling with is uh, this, um, what happened with, with the volunteer response is that government got all involved and there were two different groups. There was the La Rodney Front and there's the Muiv Miesta. And so on a local level, it, it became sort of this chaotic battle. Meanwhile, the resource centers, they just have to, you know, they've been working with a lot of just volunteers for years and like get the politics out of it. And let's just uh, 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 work with people that uh, have been trained, you know, this idea that you can just mobilize people. And I, I think it was well expressed um, this thesis that uh, a small group of uh, four people, two from Moscow, two from the regions put together, they talked about this. They said it's important to remember that volunteering is an activity of individual choice. Um, when the state is regarded as the initiator of volunteering, there is a substitution of concepts and values. Uh, we must not forget about systematic work with volunteers and not just about mobilizing them if necessary. It is important to shape shared values of personal responsibility and participation. So this is one of the fronts that, again, this post-COVID really strengthened group of uh, NGO leaders, uh, that's one of the, the, the issues that, that needs to be addressed, this idea of volunteers staying a personal initiative rather than a government uh, um, organized activity. So I, I think it's I think it's an important issue now. Yes, yeah, please, Andre. Uh, uh, I agree. I agree with uh, with Sarah. Uh, but uh, it was I think it was a huge actually a huge growth of uh, volunteering in this time of pandemic. Uh, and it was both uh, those that uh, was uh, organized uh, and kind of supported on very strongly supported by the government and um, also this just initial uh, coming from the, uh, the from from the ground this also uh, both processes were uh, in place uh, but uh, just coming back to the previous question and also answering to this one I would like to say that uh, again <laughs> because of this uh, complicated uh, pandemic period uh, we, uh, we had one another good thing about volunteering and NGOs that 
it was so many words about both uh, phenomena volunteerism and uh, uh, NGOs everywhere in the media so every day we were just uh, uh, listening and uh, watching uh, not only in social media uh, but uh, on uh, different TV channels and newspapers radio everything uh, we a lot of uh, media coverage of volunteerism and NGO activities and uh, while uh, we have a problem still in Russia that not uh, so many people are um, involved in NGO activities, uh, of course, we want more of them to participate in NGO life and uh, um, support NGOs. But uh, I'm sure that now, after this period, uh, more people will become uh, also volunteers. Either they could either come to volunteerism through uh, those NGOs that work with uh, volunteers or through uh, this uh, um, just half governmental structures that also support volunteerism. I think that both are just not bad actually, uh, and uh, uh, and many people actually um, through, uh, through this period they just uh, probably many of them they. For the first time in their life, they understood uh, uh, NGO kind of roles and um, uh, specifics, and I, I believe that they will now participate in NGO and NGO activities uh, just more than before. Thank you, Lena. And Andre, did you want to weigh in quickly? Yeah, just quickly. Um, maybe it's my bias again, political science bias, but I also see the same tendency in the volunteering sector that the state is increasing. Well, it's regulating the sector increasingly. And if you read the, the, the transcript of Vladimir Putin's meeting with this, uh, we, we are all together, uh, uh, action, whatever, like this network, it's very patronizing. It's very sort of uh, approaching it from above and saying that, well, okay, we've got funds. And in the, on that meeting, he announced it for, he, for the first Time he announced the package, the relief package that we are talking about. So I would say, like in terms of discourse, I'm not a specialist on discourse, but uh, for me, the re reading of this uh, transcript was like, yeah, the state is just increasingly patronizing of the sector, and it also again dissects uh, different types of volunteering, state supported versus an independent. I would just imagine that uh, nobody invited over the in four activists or volunteers to this meeting, even though they are also great and they also tackle the uh, the crucial issues of pandemic. Uh, uh, so yeah. All right, I'm going to try to combine uh, three questions because we're already starting to get a little short on time. Um, we have uh, two from anonymous uh, attendees and one from Joseph Bradley, but there seems to be some hunger among the audience for a little more information and detail about NGOs uh, in Russia. And so one of the questions was had to do with the distribution across the country when we're having this discussion here about NGOs, everything you've been talking about, best of times, worst of times. Is there like so many other things in the Russian context, a real distinction between what's happening in Moscow and St. Petersburg and the rest of the country? Or is this not that particular type of case? Um, there's also a question about funding. One of the things that seemed most pertinent to me the sort of biggest tension in listening across multiple talks and listening to everyone today was this tension between it's fantastic that the Russian state is providing funding to support NGOs in this time of, of, of COVID. And it's also a bit terrifying that the Russian state is providing funding to support NGOs because of all the conditions that this comes with. So there was a question about sort of alternatives uh, to funding from the state and what are the viable alternatives? Now, we're ju we just got a couple of statistics mentioned about people giving donations, uh, but there was some interest in hearing a little bit more. If you're not gonna take money from the state, where are you getting money from? And then the final question is on this, you know, just pushing a little bit on this part of the state aspect of the state relationship with the NGOs is, is that, you know, from the Western perspective, we often hear, you know, we think of the, you know, the competitive authoritarian regime, as Andre said, you know, being fairly dismissive of, uh, of you know, having a sort of trying to have a, a large footprint on the uh, on footprint on civil society and not giving civil society particularly a lot of space to grow. We've heard some more optimistic stories here. So is this actually a change? Is it, uh, you know, Sarah, and Elena, Sarah, you talked more about recognizing the value of civil society because of COVID. Is this also also being reflected in the government sort of re-envisioning its relationship with civil society to give it a little bit more space than it's had recently? Or is this just sort of a, a yes, it's a marriage of convenience, but no, and not, not a fundamental rethinking of the relationship between civil society and the state in Russia? So a lot to chew on there, but that combined a bunch of questions. So 
I, I leave that open for anyone who would like to answer that first. Yes, Sarah, I can, I can, yeah, well, I can, I can, okay, yeah, Sarah, I mean, there's that, a lot, <laughs> there's a lot there. I mean, the first is that I think that whether this is going to be a fundamental change, because as I said, the ultimate goal, and I, I want to just, first of all, sort of do a shout out to Valerie. I mean, I'm someone who's been saying for, you know, civil society isn't NGOs, right? That's, it's a much broader thing. And I actually, my focus has always been community development. The hard, NGOs is the highest end. Um, but um, what um, I think what I think is that uh, in terms of NGOs, I think that they ha they realize now that they've gotten all, uh, sort of this power and attention, visibility, power and attention. And can they leverage that into, you know, sort of pushing government? I think uh, uh, I already saw, said uh, this volunteerism, the top down heavy handed government support about volunteerism, that's going to be a pushback. Another pushback is going to be about the registry that it, you know, that it's, it's hurting Russian society that the registry isn't broader. When you make a requirement be that they had to have gotten government funding, that's cutting out too many organizations that now, because of the pandemic, it's clear you need the culture, the educational, the, the sports NGOs uh, that, that have are been independently. So I think it's, it's really up to the NGOs. And, and what I'm saying, what I'm hearing from talking to these leaders, it, leaders is an astonishing exciting group of top level professionals at the top of their game who have knowledge and skills and that are thinking in really smart strategic ways about how to pull this forward. Just quickly in terms of funding, I mean that's been the push for the last 25 years, balance, right? Um, I don't look at government funding for, as, as such a bugaboo because I started my career here with 2 million US taxpayer dollars. So, you know, and it was loaded with requirements and loaded with reporting. Lena knows all about it. So, you know, you had to do certain things. You had, they didn't want to support certain. So there's nothing, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing anything that um, uh, the, the, the presidential grants are much broader than what you know, Western international funding was willing or interested in supporting. And their mandate got smaller and smaller, as we know. I mean, so that sort of community development resource centers were getting squeezed out and it was all going over to another in another direction. Um, so the push has always been to diversify because you know, really 25 years ago, there was zero government support given in open competition to NGOs. There was zero corporate business funding, zero. Here we are 25 years later, and I'll just give you the statistics from St. Petersburg, the wonderful resource center there. In, now it's St. Petersburg, 42% um, of the NGOs get money from donations, 33% from paid services, 32.3% presidential grants, 30.8% business donations, 17.9% dues and founder contributions, 16.2% regional subsidies, 6.8% grants from other Russian and international foundations. So really, the majority are not getting government supports, but it is part of that mix. And the big push that COVID introduced, as I, as I said, is training on you know, online fundraising. And when we talk about regional differences, uh, the regions uh, were twice as badly hit in terms of donate. The, the region's much more complicated on every uh, parameter. Fundraising, uh, business out in the regions, local uh, business, they still don't quite get it. So there, there is a big difference between uh, Moscow and Petersburg and, and the regions. And the stats from CAF was that the region's donations went down you know, twice as much as they did in the, in the federal centers. Valerie? Um, I would just follow up on what, on what Sarah said, thinking about you know, the types of funding and the sources of support going back you know, 25 years ago indeed. So there's no state funding, um, there was foreign funding. Right as uh, as Sarah alluded to for uh, for NGOs um, and another thing that there wasn't back then 25 years ago was really any way for individuals to donate to causes that they were interested in right to NGOs that they or causes they wanted to support that to me is the biggest change um, probably because most of the organizations you know the, that I study aren't getting government grants, you know, they're sort of not really in that, in that mix, but they can get individual donations now. And so crowdsourcing has become, I think, a really important way to support 
civil society organizations um, in Russia, especially as foreign funding has kind of departed from the country in many ways. And also there's the whole foreign agent um, problem now where organizations may not want to get foreign funding uh, because of those because uh, of those restrictions. Um, so I would just highlight the fact that now anybody who has a smartphone, um, you know, can make a donation to uh, to a civil society organization, and that's just an enormous change. Andre, yeah, just quickly on the original density of organizations and maybe on funding. Um, so there is a statistics of the Ministry for Justice on that, but it's messy. So we're just currently working on that, and uh, I also checked yesterday. The numbers for the regions, so Ministry of Economic Development, they have numbers for, different, for for the regions. And just you know, out of my head, it seems like, of course, the majority of the organizations that the NGOs, civil society organizations that exist, they are concentrating enormously in uh, in large urban hubs like Moscow, St. Petersburg, Yekaterinburg, Perm, Kazan, Novosibirsk. So it's when we are talking about the civil society development, it's mostly concentrated, of course, in the, in the major urban hubs. So without any correlations or statistics, I can just you know, uh, I I can give it out. Uh, of my head um uh and uh, the ethnic republics for instance they are the, uh, the lowest sort of bound of this uh, organizational density of uh, ngos so in chechnya or kabardino balkaria there is almost uh, nothing uh, th those who receive for th those who are on the lists of uh, uh, ministry uh, in this package they are almost non-existent there, which is, I think, a problem because uh, it also creates the inequalities uh, on the regional scale. On the funding, I think it's a very important question. We've got a poll uh, last year, uh, 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 December, uh, January, and about a third of our uh, um, organization surveyed, it's 90, 94 organization, reported that they have uh, presidential grants. About a third also mentioned regional sub subsidies from the regional uh, governments, and about a third also reported uh, business so I think business plays a great role here anyway, apart from crowdsourcing and apart from governmental funding. For instance, Potanin Foundation, they pledged to have like 1 billion uh, rubles increase uh, recently to, uh, again, to relieve uh, the NGOs. I think it's an enormous help. Now, but again, I think coming back to the regional dimension, yes, it's important, uh, you know, to have the affluent uh, region that uh, you know where the businesses are located to su support this uh, channeling of the of the funds. So it again uh, comes down to the question of inequalities and sort of you know uneven distribution of these risks and benefits uh, in the sector, especially uh, uh, wise. Right. So now I'd like to bring uh, Denise into the conversation um, to address a question from Ann Cooper, um, who. Um, writes, uh, the constitutional vote was only a few days ago, but do you think that the outcome of that vote will lead to new Kremlin actions against journalists and possibly to civil society groups that work on human rights and other sensitive issues? And if the quarantine does lead to more active society, do you think that independent journalism should receive more active support? For example, you note know that journalists have participated in individual pickets to support arrested journalists such as uh, Ivan Safranov, uh, would you expect to see more non-journalists join in these protests? So let's start with Denise and then anyone else who'd like to weigh in on this issue. And um, this is a, a 10 minute warning. So um, uh, we'd like to get one more question in uh, after this. Thanks. Uh, thank you. And maybe also a couple of figures on uh, previous, uh, previous question. Uh, but well, in NGOs in Russia, it's only about a couple of percent of population uh, work, so only about two percent. But if we look at uh, uh, broader uh, outside of NGOs, it's about five seven percent who are engaged in volunteering. It's in, it's already not so uh, um, situated not only in the biggest uh, uh, cities, of course. And uh, when we look at uh, people coming together in solving problems, it's already 13%, so much, uh, much more. And about 20% who donated something for kind of a, a good cause. So it's kind of a, well, we, we have bear it in mind, uh, different dimension of this civil society. Uh, answering this question, I think it's, of course, uh, very speculative on my side, but uh, in a sense, uh, maybe this uh, uh, voting on constitution, uh, constitutional amendments, it's somehow 
right after it, we uh, saw a series of uh, arrests of uh, uh, activists. So maybe it's also kind of a feeling that the regime is stable, that the regime can go on on uh, pressuring its uh, uh, the people who are not um, going in line with it. So maybe this uh, uh, into this. Uh, uh, growing pressure. But uh, already before it, we saw several cases of pressure on the, instit uh, on the institutional level, on the uh, free freedom of speech, on the newspapers, Vietnamese being one of the uh, fresh victims of this pressure. Again, it is, is not connected with quarantine or uh, constitutional amendments, but it's uh, overall a uh, very long process of uh, pressuring on civil society but at the same at the same point we uh, we also see the resilient of uh, uh, those journalists uh, who uh, uh, come up with new projects such as Medusa and the bell and so on but the problem is that the audience of these uh, media they are growing smaller but at the same time, again, the internet provides uh, more sphere for criticism and access to the uh, to the uh, to the free media. But breaking the existing uh, the existing media with the existing audience uh, audiences it uh, harms the cause of free speech in Russia. But again, the process is uh, uh, much more difficult and uh, much more. Uh, uh, well, several dimensions of this, not only one direction in which the situation is developed. Anyone else uh, like to weigh in on this? Question of journalism? Okay, so uh, Josh, uh, why don't you ask uh, the final question and uh, close, uh, close the session today? Uh, Josh? Sorry, I'm on mute. <laughs> yep. uh, we had a couple of questions having to do with environmental NGOs and environmentalist movements in civil society. So Maria Cidrokina asked uh, Andre and others, if you can speak to this, you mentioned the thick collaboration and knowledge sharing between NGOs is a key feature of the sector in Russia. Some areas of civic NGO work, uh, including environmental issues over development are typically also issues for local political activists turning parks into corporate land or building churches in green zones. Have you observed the sort of more rigid social boundaries? Have you observed sort of boundaries between the social and political activists or are they getting sort of more thickly intertwined uh, between them? And then there was some question, there was this sort of uh, also question about um, what, what has the pandemic in particular done in terms of the ability for sort of civil society in the environmental sector, which has been getting a lot more attention in Russia in recent years. Has that been unduly harmed? Is there anything different about the environmental sector from others? So I don't know, Andre, maybe you wanna kick it off and then anyone else who's interested in speaking to this, these questions. Yeah, thank, I'll try to be brief. I think I, I'm not going to go into this direction because I think uh, that deep because it's a topic on itself, how these social activism, political activism are, are intertwined. I think those who observe sort of, uh, again, uh, protests and uh, contentious politics in Russia, they know that local activism usually is sort of decoupled from the political. So many local activists, urban activists and uh, environmental activists that are doing the, 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 the groundwork, they're, all, uh, they're quite suspicious uh, of the political politics parties or the other organized opposition. Now, uh, and I mean, it comes in waves, I, I would say, like at a certain point of time, like for fire election movements, at the heads of the movement, uh, there was this collation between the uh, social and political activism, even prior to the for fire election campaign itself, as we saw in, in various studies, uh, as well, like in Nav Navalny's campaign 2017, 2018, also showed how the sort of uh, local activism can be melted into the political one, but it's not stable over time. So there are no, I would say, my impression is that there are, there, there, there is still this d divide between the political and social activism. More recently in Moscow, this 
uh, building and construction of Yugo Vastochna Horda uh, also shows that, well, there are some local uh, council members, for instance, eager to help, but there is still suspicious uh, suspicion on, the, on, on behalf of the local residents to work with these politicians. Uh, uh, and uh, there is suspicion about their intentions for good, of course, given our experience. But, uh, you know, I think it's it's changes. It's not stable, uh, but the boundaries are still there, I would say. Does anyone else want to weigh in on this? Uh, Denise? Uh, and then Sarah? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, my, my feeling uh, is that uh, environmental issues are, are among the most appealing to the public because it's very, uh, well, uh, people understand what uh, is it about. And uh, I would say they, uh, these issues are, um, well, rotate about two Two main problems. One is uh, the defending of parks that are being developed, and uh, uh, we have numerous cases uh, of this. And uh, it's about local, local environment defending your actual backyard. Uh, and the second uh, very important issue issue is uh, garbage disposal. Uh, and I think uh, when we speak uh, about an, uh, environmental issues. Uh, it's the the main issue that uh, come uh, comes to mind uh, 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 for ordinary people, this garbage disposal. So the biggest story, obviously, is uh, shears, which in a couple of years people were able to bring to the, I mean, the uh, federal level, and probably they. Well, I'm cautious uh, speaking about it, but uh, probably they won. And again, uh, this shears. Uh, a story. It provided astonishing results in the sense when we are, were doing a, a survey uh, about this in Arkhangelsk region, 95% of the population were ag against uh, uh, of it. Uh, uh, I can hardly remember any issue that were, was so uh, unifying for the for the public. But again, it's uh, also the result of this. Uh, uh, campaign that was taking place on the regional level when the activists come together with the free media, free local media, and also with their uh, um, attention from the uh, uh, other parts of the country. So it's uh, uh, absolutely uh, a wonderful example where civil society probably finally what what they uh, what it wanted because it seems to, uh, to me that uh, uh, the government is uh, trying to stop this now. So maybe this is a uh, this is a well, victory for civil society, and it's an environmental issue. Sarah, I just wanted to say that in terms of this social versus political, I think the issue the tension is more in terms of strategy. Um, strategy choices. And I, th I think that there's, uh, and perhaps, uh, so I think it is an issue of sort of people getting to know each other and working together and then uh, d sort of maybe overcoming these huge differences in strategic approaches uh, to solving problems. But what I wanted to do is maybe end on a, on a positive note, because I do think that I live, you know, we live, I live in, you know, I've been spending the pandemic down in a village in, in the Altai Republic. It's one of the poorest regions of Russia. It's, I've, we've had a house in the village for 20 years. And every time I want to know the real world, I, you know, I, I just, I'm back in the village and um, where we have the same mayor for 20 years, you know, it's, it's a ridiculous situation. But um, for, for, you know, the first 19 years, there was nothing. I tried to mobilize people, nothing. This right now, there are three three actions going on in the one village. Um, two of them are, are by people, me, you know, and, and another sort of newcomer. But one, the one most significant one is a grandmother there who called me over one day and she heard that there was going to be a, a cell phone tower put near her house. She wanted to do something about it. And I thought that, you know, you know, you're always looking for the green shoots. Um, and when all of a sudden, and I said, we'll get out there, we're not going to win, but go out and get she, in three hours. She had 54 signatures. Like some people were scared to sign, but I said, you know, we're going to submit it because they got to know that now we've got, there's a, there's a garbage protest going on. Another group of people are doing, you know, we're not, this is on the village level in one of the poorest regions in the country. This, 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 this change is happening in uh, amongst babushkas 
and local people who are less scared and, uh, and, and willing, and that's why the resource centers, it's important that when you have people accessible who can give them the training and the skills and knowledge they need to be effective so that they can start to have more wins like they had in our Congos. Um, Elena or Valerie, would you guys like to make a final comment? Oh uh, yeah, no? just a few words about environmental NGOs, just a few examples of their work during this uh, pandemic period. They also were very active and some of our environmental groups, they uh, were, were providing trainings on how to deal with this, a uh, lot of additional waste, you know, co connected with this pandemic, and uh, these gloves and masks and everything. So they were providing trainings, they were just uh, educating people on how to deal with this uh, new type of uh, waste, ta tons of waste. And um, uh, but and, and uh, another interesting example I just learned today about our um, not only environmental NGOs but also our those working in with the sustainable development issues that just uh, during this uh, pandemic period they somehow managed to provide uh, um, the country alternative uh, civil report on UN sustainable development goals uh, just process to achieving these goals uh, in Russia. So now we have two reports, like in other many other countries, this official report and uh, uh, this alternative civic report, with, which uh, actually is a huge work that was provided by this civil society um, players working in our country. Thanks. Great. Well, before I thank the panelists and thank all of you for being here today, I want to just give a shout out. We have uh, we normally end this series with the end of the semester, but this year, given our unique circumstance, we've continued it through the summer and we're going to have one more session this summer, which will be on July 31st. And we are really pleased that we've been able to get uh, David Scheimer, who is the author of the newly released book Rigged and Kathleen Hall Jamison and Renee DeResta of the Stanford Internet Observatory to come talk about lessons for 2020 from Russian interference in the US 2016 elections. So it's a great panel uh, that we've got together. This is going to be Friday, July 31st. It'll be at this same time at noon so we can get people in Moscow in the evening and we can get people on the West Coast in the, in the morning. But if you wanna mark that down on your calendars now, um, that'll be the last New York City Russia public policy event before we start up strong again in the fall. And we'll of course be virtual and live streamed and on, and on Zoom. So with that out of the way, I wanna thank, um, thank the Harriman Institute and Alex Cooley. I wanna thank again, uh, Sasha Spatalnik for suggesting this topic and for doing yeoman's work and lining up our amazing speakers. I wanna thank all of the speakers for giving us their time today and joining us for what has been a totally fascinating conversation. I've learned a ton, I'm sure everybody else has. I wanna thank all of our audience who stuck with us for almost uh, two hours here. It's been such a fascinating discussion. And uh, thank you for joining us today and giving us part of your time today. And, uh, and with that, I'll bid everyone farewell and say thanks once again.